was uh, just reflecting it that um, exactly one year ago, uh, on a fall, uh, beautiful day here in Grand Junction, a moving truck pulled into town, filled with some household goods, um, and uh, three lovely people. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and on Sunday, uh, October 23rd, I preached my first sermon here in this pulpit. Uh, so I've been here for a year now, and uh, I'm just reflecting on how good God is and how good it is to be amongst a people so loving and so generous, and uh, what a beautiful community this is. My first sermon I preached was on the stained glass windows um, that I didn't know were here until I got into the pulpit. And... I was so uh, inspired by them that I, I had to, I had to wrap them into uh, what I had to preach on. And so today I turn back to these stained glass windows and I, I just want you to take a moment and look at these windows and the nature that they uh, invoke, the environment, the leaves, the flowers, the sun and the stars, the moon, the wheat, the butterflies, the birds, the fish, and in our back window, um, we've got the flexibility to turn it all the way around and look up uh, that we have the wheat and the grapes that represent um, the elements of communion that we share uh, every first Sunday of the month around the table here in the church. You see, these are all uh, invoking of nature, and um, nature is the environment in which we live and breathe. It is creation which God created, not for us, but uh, because of us. God knew that we needed a place to thrive and to grow in. We needed a place to serve, that we might be useful. And so this morning, um, I want us to, to do a little uh, imagery. We're going to do a little meditation uh, with imagery. And I want you to just take a deep breath and close your eyes. And I want you to picture your favorite tree. Maybe it's your favorite type of tree. Or a tree in your yard. Or a tree that you see outside of your window childhood tree that you climbed in. Perhaps it is a tree that was planted for you. I want you to picture yourself as the seed of that tree. Picture that you are lying on the ground and slowly over time you sink into the ground. Allow your body to be held by where you sit. Feel that you've relaxed into the warmth of all there is that nourishes you. And then set your roots free into the soil. Seek the nutrients that will nurture your body. Imagine as your feet firmly ground themselves and your arms perhaps stretch out a little bit in front of you, that you are taking in all that this world has to offer. And now you grow. You are young and fragile at first, breaking forth from the earth and the soil. You reach the light. Whereas once you had been in darkness and held in the comfort of the earth, now you are above it. You are uh, breaking forth to the sun, and the sky, and the air, to the wind and the rain. And now you produce leaves, maybe pine needles, and you grow. You grow. You feel yourself become freer and freer with the time that passes. Imagine your leaves as they shake in the wind. 
The noise that they make is a joyous noise. Celebrates all that God has provided and given. And as you breathe deeply in, you take in the good nutrients and as you breathe out, you let go of the stress and the anxiety and the bad that sometimes becomes a part of our environment. And with each and every single breath, we clean ourselves. We add to the energy of our lives, to our grace and our peace. Take two deep breaths and then open your eyes. The way in which we grow and are nurtured is a part of God's plan. It is part of, if you will, God's economy. For everything that we need is already provided. The nutrients, the food, the environment, the wind and the rain. Even in our own context, we are provided with the things that give us life and living. Our, friend, our family, our friends community in which we gather here each and every single morning, every Sunday. These are the elements that give us life and renew us, not only in body and mind, but also in spirit. I can't help but by reading today's Matthew text about uh, Jesus' uh, response to the religious leaders, give to God what is God's and give to Caesar what is Caesar's, how much Jesus is talking about the economy of God, how much God gives us and what God provides for us. You see, God's economy is one that is built on what is really given and not earned. We do not earn the air. There's nothing we can do that would provide us more air. It is freely given to us. Love and friendship, the things that we bring into our own bodies to nourish ourselves, these are all already provided in the world. Um, and yet there are other economies that we work within uh, in our lives. Um, talk about the, the government that uh, provides us uh, safe communities by providing police and medical care and uh, leadership. We um, talk about uh, the ways that our schools are Signed here to help us raise our children and teach them. There are things that we pay into so that we might get back from. This, so when Jesus is talking with the Pharisees and uh, this kind of uh, carries over from last week's sermon when we saw that um, the context here is important. Jesus is ridden into Jerusalem near the end of his ministry leading up to the Last Supper and his crucifixion and resurrection. And Jesus' first act is to turn over the tables of the money changers in the temple. And then he goes into the temple and starts telling parables to the religious leaders, criticizing their leadership and asking that they would have more grace and mercy for the people um, whom God has invited and welcomed into the kingdom. So at that point, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, decide that they will entrap him, that they are going to try to catch him so that uh, they might get rid of him because he's becoming a nuisance. And they, Jesus has really made some people mad. So they ask him a question that they are sure will get him into trouble. And so they ask him about taxes. And they say, is it right to pay the tax to Caesar? <coughs> and if Jesus says, yes, you should pay the tax to Caesar. Jesus is actually denouncing the uh, God economy that he has been preaching on. The economy of love and graciousness. The unconditional uh, uh, love that God gives to all people. Um, as David Lose says, uh, a, a preacher and theologian, that uh, there are two groups that normally want little to do with each other. The Herodians, 
derived their power from the Roman occupiers, while the Pharisees aligned more closely with the occupied and oppressed commoners. They both declare a truce in order to work together to trap this uh, rabble-rouser rabbi. The question they pose is beyond clever asking Jesus whether it was lawful to pay the poll or the imperial tax that funded the Roman occupation to support their occupiers. Should Jesus answer yes, the adoration of the crowds, his followers, would likely evaporate. For he would be saying, yes, you need to support those who are oppressing you. But Rather, um, those followers would turn into an opposition to Jesus, and he would be held accountable to those whom he was preaching a different kingdom, a different economy. Should Jesus answer, no, do not pay the tax, then he will have positioned himself over and against the Romans, which was never a wise thing to do. He would have been arrested and persecuted as a um, uh, a rebel who was trying to um, say, don't pay the taxes uh, to the Romans. So these Pharisees and religious leaders think that they have Jesus trapped. Or at least that's what they think. Because if their question is clever, then Jesus' response is ingenious. Or maybe even more appropriately inspired. Which leads to an exchange that is brief but revealing. After asking if any of his questioners have a coin of the empire, the only coin uh, that could be used to pay this tax in question, they quickly produce that coin. And Jesus asks whose image is on it, and they answer, the emperor's. There's more going on here than meets the eye, as along with that image is an engraved confession of Caesar's divinity. Paying the tax with Caesar's head on that coin is also admitting that Jesus is God, or that uh, Caesar is God. Which means that any Jew holding a coin is breaking the first two of the commandments. All which leads to Jesus' closing line, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and give to God the things that are God's. And with that one sentence, Jesus does not simply evade or trap their trap or confound their plans, but issues a challenge to the hearers that reverberates through the ages and into our sanctuary here this morning. It is not merely a response to the Pharisees, but a challenge to us that if we are ones who side with the economy of the empire, that is a meritocracy, you are only worth what you earn. You have to work and earn your living to earn your worth. You are worthless if you are not a worker or able. And this is highly opposed to the economy of God, which says that no matter who you are, no matter your ability or disability, no matter what you look like, no matter what you do when you first get up in the morning or what you do right before you go to bed, you are a worthy human being. You are my child. God's economy gives graciously and abundantly. God's economy does not demand anything in return, but only asks for us faithfulness, to seek to be better people, to understand our own a role inside of God's economy to give love and to receive love in return. You see, the Pharisees try to set up a trap, and I, I hear in the background uh, from the Star Wars movie Admiral Akbar saying, "It's a trap," uh, as they uh, as, as, uh, as a famous line in the Star Wars movie. Jesus recognizes this trap, and. Instead of falling into it, he, he offers a third way. He pushes back and challenges and says, if you're a Herodian, if you're one who buys into the meritocracy, the economy that says that you're only worth what you pay into it, then you need to pay more attention to God's economy. And if you are one who is a Pharisee who is paying solely attention 
to uh, the work of God, and you are not living in the reality here and now, then you are ignoring the real plight of the people who are struggling to get by, who are homeless, jobless, who are on that threshold of poverty. And we owe it to ourselves to create just cultures and societies in which we care for the least of these. It's not enough to just say, I believe in God, leave it at that. Our belief in God calls us into action. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says that God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the wild animals of the earth and every other creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. David Lose, the um, preacher and theologian I mentioned earlier, says, pause for a moment and let that idea seek in. We are made in the image and likeness of God. And because we bear God's likeness, we are to act like God. Not, mind you, like gods, those who lord their authority over others for self-gain, but rather like God, the one who creates and sustains and nourishes and redeems and saves no matter what the cost. We are all called, that is, to serve as God's agents, God's partners and God's co-workers, exercising dominion over creation, not as an act of power, but rather as an act of stewardship. And extending to all the abundant life God wishes for all. Going back to this image of the tree, we all start as seeds. We receive nourishment from sources outside of ourselves, and we grow, and we flourish. Um, there's an old uh, uh, saying that I forget where it comes from, but um, there are trees, uh, certain trees down in the south of uh, the United States that live in these bogs, and they suck in water. And if these trees don't expel the water that they've sucked in, then that water actually becomes toxic to them. It makes them rot from the inside, and so they have to let go of the water. Think about the tree and all the nutrients that it takes in. It does not give back oxygen for us to breathe, or let its leaves fall or uh, shed bark, or let other insects inhabit it. It, uh, it, if it holds all of, the, of that which it receives in, it becomes a toxic tree and it can rot from the inside. It has to let go of the water. It has to let go of the air. That's God's economy. That we aren't greedy, that we don't hold on to more than we need, but we take in what sustains us and gives back. So let us be like the trees of our dreams, the trees of this earth, the trees of faith, which are grounded firmly in faith, and which grow to serve this world. Jesus asks that we might obey the first commandment the most important commandment, which is to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, souls, and minds. And our psalm this morning speaks to that, that we praise God. Praise God in all the heavens. Praise the one who made the heavens and the earth, for no other has done this. But God alone. I don't know about you, but I want to continue living in God's economy, seeking ways that I can integrate God's economy better into this world which is so in need of unconditional love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. That's the economy that God provides. That's the economy that Jesus wants us to buy into. Amen.